Montefoscoli, November 12th, 1939. My dear daughter, it is with great sadness that I heard what happened. Your transfer and your sufferings are a cause of great worry for me. It will take time, but you'll see, things will improve. They'll treat you and you'll get better again. I pray a lot, every day. Write to me often and tell me if you need anything. I promise I'll do what I can. Try to be strong. Mom. This is the last letter she wrote to me. Once I was put into this ward, I was overwhelmed by loneliness. After that medical examination, I received no more letters from Mom. Why is that man here? Why doesn't she come to see me? Did I make a mistake? It didn't seem like she wanted to abandon me. What did I do wrong? I'd like to be able to reply to her again now, to change things. she would have listened to me. Will she reply? The letters were sent to the archive. It was their job to post them. When you were sent to a lunatic asylum, you lost the right to possess anything. Everything you arrived with was packed up and stored here, even the clothes you were wearing, in case you were released one day, but far too many never left. Dear Mother, Please, I beg you, get me out of this place. I'm so frightened here. You were right. I know I was wrong. I understand. I'm so ashamed. If only you knew how much. But now I'll behave myself, I promise. Now things will be fine. I'll work hard. I'll be very good. Your daughter, Renee. This letter... It was Renée's letter, just as she wrote it back then. But it was never sent. Why? Why did this happen? I received your letter, Mom. You tell me to be patient and strong, while I only feel fear and pain. And you don't write to me any more. If only these words could be my soul. I'd tell you what was happening to me. The kids want to kill me. They all look the other way and tell me what to do. I don't understand. She helps me, but what have they done to her? Can you tell me? Will you help me? Renee.
Montefoscoli, July 7th, 1940. My dear daughter, I have received no news from you. You have not contacted me in months. I'm sorry, but I don't have the money to come and visit you. Do you remember Mr. Onofrio? He'll soon be in Volterra for business. I've asked him if he would be kind enough to ask the director for some news about you. I hope he'll bring me some good news when he returns. But please write to me. I know that I was strict with you. You have to forgive me. I didn't think. I've given Mr. Onofrio a new doll for you. You told me that you lost yours, and I know you loved it so much. It's not as nice as your Charlotte, but I hope that it will comfort you nonetheless. Keep your chin up, darling. Everything will be fine, you'll see. Mom. Montefoscoli, October 12th, 1940. My dear daughter, I've written two letters to you and have received no reply. Every day, I'm anxiously waiting for a letter. Mr. Onofrio's back. He brought you the doll. Do you like it? He told me he was unable to speak to the director, but managed to see you. I pray for you every day. Even Don Gino said a prayer for you during Sunday Mass. Isn't that nice? I've made up my mind, Rene. I'm bringing you home. I've already written to the director. I told him that I'll take care of you. I'm not very well at the moment and can't work, but I'll get better soon, you'll see. And as soon as I can make the journey, I'll come and fetch you. I know you're suffering a lot, but please be strong, I beg you. Mom will come to fetch Renee, won't she? Mom is good, but she's not well. That's why that man came. The doll... Renée could have played with it while she was waiting for her to arrive, but Renée didn't have it with her. Is it one of Mom's lies? She knew that she'd hurt Renée, and... No, no, Mommy's good. That man brought it. We've just remembered who he is, haven't we? It was Renée who was wrong. The doll's here. I know that for sure. Perhaps she's been abducted like all the others, and is locked up here somewhere. Let's look for the second doll. It'll be among the bundles of the patient's belongings. Now we can open the bundle on that table in front of the window. You see? Mom was good. I was bad. Mom was worried about Renee and Charlotte. I abandoned Charlotte. We've abandoned her. Let's look for Charlotte. We have abandoned her. Will she still be where we abandoned her, under the warm lights?
I didn't, I didn't do, do anything. anything. I just obeyed orders. I only obeyed orders. Mom Surely the dust got away. Mom I will didn't come and get us. She loves us. I only Even obeyed orders. Mom leave us alone. Surely I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. Mom will come and get us. I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. Even though we're bad. Mom won't leave us alone. I didn't do anything. Charlotte gone away. I only obeyed orders. Mom will come and get us now. She loves us, even though we're bad. I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. What was that doctor writing, sitting at his desk? September 7th, 1938. The patient frequently indulges in recriminations expressed in an explosive tone of voice. This morning she threw away the milk, saying it was full of urine, spittle, and all kinds of other filth. Crazed, she hears voices that order her to do things. She says she heard children singing and that they were locked up in a school. January 20th, 1939. Introverted, dazed, cannot focus on anything. When questioned and stimulated, she starts crying and weeping. At other times she laughs. June 1st. Apathetic, eats very little, she refuses to be touched, does not respond, spends her time in the grounds, 
The cooks report that she sits on a bench in front of the kitchens, October 14th. Return of impulsive behavior. This morning she asked for two eggs to make tzabayoni, but when she got them, she threw them up in the air. Excited, clamorous, slightly confused, takes her clothes off. December 8th, tied to bed for 15 days. High-spirited, tends to make witty comments and use vulgar words, laughs hysterically and pleasures herself. The nurses report that about two weeks ago she remained in the showers on her own and didn't want to leave. They said that when they took her away she swore at them and then lashed out and bit them. Two nurses had to be treated for their injuries. They've kept her tied to the bed since then. Transferred to the slightly agitated ward from the care of Dr. B to the care of Dr. C. I was with Amara in the showers. My memories are terrifying. They're not real, are they? December 15th, Dr. C. Patient notes. The abnormality of her psychic state has induced her to lead a life which is irregular and tends towards delinquency. Of fickle and flighty character, she regularly discards her household duties and engages in occasional prostitution. Delinquency? Prostitution? Renee? It seems so strange, unreal. It can't be true. And Amara? She loved us and would tell us everything. She wouldn't hide anything from us. Her mental deficiency makes her deaf to the reprimands of her family. She has shown suicidal tendencies. She was brought to the ward yesterday, agitated and hysterical. Treated with cardiazole, two injections a week for five weeks. They were only trying to confuse us with the therapy, and my god, they succeeded. It was as if they wanted to instill the madness into us. Therapy's removed the light for a while, but also all her will, desire, and hope. It was torture, but we had no choice. Nobody explained anything. No one tried to help us understand. We were like farm animals. June 2nd. After a long period of calm and improvement, the patient is very agitated today and vehemently refuses to submit to a gynecological examination. She swears and curses those helping her, flailing her arms and hitting them. According to reports by Dr. B, the patient has been subjected to periodic checkups since she had a spontaneous abortion about two years ago in her third month of pregnancy. Conception occurred after she had sexual intercourse with a stranger who sneaked into the hospital grounds. Details are contained in the charges filed at police headquarters in Volterra, a copy of which is attached to these clinical notes. ES Therapy how the reality is concealed. It has all been planned very carefully. June 13th. The nurses report that she descended into a state of great mental confusion after receiving her mother's letter. She threw her soup over another inmate because she was very anxious and then punched a nurse. Impulsive, 
flails about her. She rails against the doctor in vulgar terms while he is examining her, lashes out and spits. Block all correspondence to give the patient no further reason to become agitated. August 20th, tied to bed. The nurses report that the patient is extremely agitated after the visit of a relative or family friend. Two days later, she is still shouting all the time that he commands her, that she must obey and harm herself, and that she is not Charlotte. All visits forbidden, constrained to bed, and intensification of ES therapy until we achieve results. No contact with the outside. That way, nobody knew what was happening within these walls. Calm down. You must be calm. Don't get agitated. We'll make you calm down. Is that the only thing that matters? Is tranquility worth the price of not living? March 3rd. Alert. Correct attitude. Replies when questioned. The nurses report that the patient is calm. She washes and looks after herself. She affirms the existence of a certain Amara. She says that Amara is a patient who disappeared when she was moved to this ward. No confirmation. Probably a regressive hallucination. Evaluate transfer. Did I imagine Amara? That's not possible. She was there. I know she was there. I feel it. She must have left some traces of her presence. We can look for her things in the storeroom, containing the bundles of the patient's belongings, on the upper floor. These are Amara's things, I'm certain. Amara, there she is. She existed. She really did exist. There she is, my friend. March 12th, 1938. The young girl Renee arrived today. Poor thing, she was terrorized. You see, she remembers the first time we met. I talked to her mother, the dear lady, and she expressed her fears to me and I promised I'd keep an eye on her daughter. The lady told me her daughter's doll had been taken away and this worried her. 
because when she becomes depressed, as she is now, Renee barricades herself in her room and can't communicate. The doll becomes her voice, eyes, and ears. Dr. B said I'll soon get out of here. I'm sorry. I'm so sad to leave Renee. I won't be able to protect her anymore. My poor friend. She was hoping to be able to get out of here, but nobody ever leaves this place. That poor girl is really ill. I am the only one she ever speaks to. I told her I was leaving, and she stared at me, saying that I would never leave. It was quite unnerving, and then she started to cry. I felt like crying, too. She didn't say anything else. What worries me is that I'm sure that terrible man is watching her. He was the one who brought her here, and of all the good people, why did it have to be him? She knew. I told her everything. She knew about that man. But I instructed a nurse friend of mine to keep an eye on her, and I'm sure she will, because she's a good woman. Her friend the nurse. I vaguely remember. She worked on this ward. Let's look for signs of the nurse in the nurse's room on the upper floor.